name is Francis Buckley, and I'm a Los Angeles-based audio engineer. I've been doing this uh, about 35 years in all kinds of projects, uh, from Black Flag to Quincy Jones. I've had a number one jazz album, I've had a number one country record, a number one R&B record, number one rock record. So I've had the pleasure and the privilege in my career to have worked with all kinds of different music, which is one of the things I think that's kept me excited about what I do is that every day I walk in the studio and it's something new. Well today we had a road microphone clinic here at Musicians Institute in Hollywood and my plan was I wanted to introduce road microphones to the students because they're really great microphones. We have a lot of people come here and do clinics and sometimes they bring in high-end stuff and the students go, "Ooh, wow, that's really cool. But it's a piece of gear that's 2,500 bucks. So I wanted to introduce them to them, these really, really great microphones that are inexpensive and a great way for them to start their uh, microphone collection, which is it's a very important thing. That's your toolbox. Mostly what I'm using today are Rhodes' newest microphones. The NT1, which is what I've got here on the kick drum. I've got NT1s on the high tom and the floor tom, and I've got an NT1 on the bass. On the hi-hat and on the ride cymbal, I have the new Rode M5s. They are a matched stereo pair. Some people think match means consecutive serial numbers. Match means they're electronically balanced so that they're within a certain tolerance of each other. So they come with a little certificate that says matched within 1 dB. So you can put these two things up in a stereo pair and know that you're getting a very nicely matched pair of microphones. Great place to start building a microphone collection. On the overheads and on our vocalist, I have Rhodes' newest endeavor in microphones, and that is a ribbon microphone. This is the, the Rode NTR ribbon microphone. They have a nice, warm quality to them. They're not bright. It has a typical high-end kind of roll-off on it, but that's inherent in ribbon microphones. A high-quality ribbon microphone will cost you $1,500. These microphones are about $700 street. They have a power supply and they have a transformer built into the bottom, so you run them off of regular Phantom 48 volts. The ribbon motor itself is actually shock mounted, so that's why you see there's no shock mount on this. When you go to travel, they have these little pins that go inside the top of the mic and, and hold the motor steady for transportation. On the electric guitar, I've got the Rode S1. The S1 is actually a handheld condenser microphone. They built it for live work. On the snare drum, I've got their M1, which is the, the dynamic version of the S1. Really, really great live microphones. If you're used to using an SM58, you should try one of these M1s or S1s. You'll be blown away because they've got a lot more output to them. They're, uh, they're much more rugged. They've got a slightly less high-end bump on them, which makes them sound much more natural. The stereo microphone is in the front, pointed down toward the hammers with one capsule pointing toward the high and one capsule pointing toward the low. The problem with acoustic piano is that nobody listens to the piano with their head stuck inside of it. <laughs> so it's always kind of a dodgy sort of thing getting a good mic sound on a piano or getting a, a good piano sound because the mics are in a very unnatural place. But if you pull them out into the room, then we get a lot more room sound. I get a lot of questions from students asking me, what's a great vocal microphone? Okay. Well, they're all great vocal microphones if you know how to use them, right? Sometimes the best microphone in the world happens to be the one you've got in your hand because it's the only one you got. <laughs> you got to record. So here it is. Here's the mic we're going to use. My inspiration was reading this book on recording the Beatles and they weren't focusing on the music, they were focusing on the equipment and the techniques. They were live in the studio, no headphones, the band set up, everybody's in the room together. There's Ringo's drums, here's John and George's amplifier, there's Paul's bass, there's John and Paul standing in front of a microphone facing each other singing with no headphones. And I thought, you know, this is something I know the students have never seen. One day we'll record the drums and the next day we'll do the bass and then we'll do the guitar and you know obviously we're teaching them audio engineering but they've never seen anything like this where we just set it up live let it fly and what happens happens we've all heard the beatles music over the years right anybody ever see them play live nope and you never will either so the only performances we have are the ones that are on the records and that's where the performance has got to be. So as an audio engineer or as a producer, your job is to pull those performances out of the artist. You've got to give the artist whatever the artist needs in order to make that performance happen. Is it the lighting? Is it the mood? Is it the catering? Is it the scent in the room? Is it whatever it takes to get that performance? A perfect performance is not every note is right. 
was Beethoven who said, playing a wrong note is inconsequential. Playing without passion is unforgivable. This guy is good, man. To me, one of the things that I sort of feel is missing from modern production is we have everything clocked to a click track. We've got everything auto-tuned. We've got everything fixed and timed, and it kind of takes a lot of the emotion out of it. And here, the song is happening all together, and it all has to come down together because I'm not going to be able to go in and fix any notes because everybody's in the room together. Sometimes you listen to your favorite record from you know the 60s and 70s, and you hear some little mistake in there. It's like, wow. That's actually really cool. These people are real. They're actually real musicians in the room happening together. Mic placement is extremely important because the where the mic is in relationship to the instrument makes a whole lot of difference. I'm always telling the students, why don't we try moving the mic a little bit and see what we get. Move it this way, move it that way. Sometimes where you put it first is the best place, but you know, take five minutes and go out and move it and you may find a spot that, that, that hits better. So it's all experimentation. Now for this particular session, I've got the kick drum mic right in front of the hole. Normally what I would do is I would take my dynamic microphone and I would put it right inside the hole. There is a column of compressed air that's being pushed out of that hole. And if I get my dynamic microphone right in the center of that, I won't have to use a compressor on the mic in the mix because it's already compressed as it's coming out. The snare drum, I've got it just beyond the rim of the drum because the snare drum will have a bit of a ring to it. So if you get your snare drum mic in away from the rim, you're going to get rid of that ring. The other thing is to make sure that your drums are tuned up nicely. That makes a huge difference in the way drums sound. With the toms, I'm using the ring of this microphone right on the edge of the drum head so that the mic is up over and looking into the drum. The drummer is always going to be playing on a V. So I've got the microphone up high enough so that it's out of their way but pointing down into the V. The reason I always use a ride cymbal, because people say, doesn't it get picked up in the, in the overheads? Yes, it does get picked up in the overheads. But if the producer wants a little bit more ride cymbal in the mix, and I don't have a ride cymbal mic, the only thing I can do is bring up the overheads, and that brings up everything. Now, all of these mics are all gonna bleed into one another around the drum set. There's no way to get around it. And I've seen guys do all kinds of crazy things to try to block the snare drum mic so it doesn't pick up any of the hi-hat. What that does is it puts this big thing in the way. The drummer, the keyboard player, the guitar player, I shouldn't force them to change what they do in order to accommodate my miking techniques. I should be able to put my mics around and have them out of their way. Now the overhead mics, I usually try to get them down as close to the drum set as I can get them so that they're capturing more of the drum set and less of the room. I try to get the mics as low as I possibly can so the drummer is not hitting them. With the bass cabinet, I've got the microphone up high so that it's looking at sort of the, the edge of the speaker so it's getting the wave as it's coming off the speaker. Same with the guitar, although the guitar is right up against it. The reason I want it right up against it is I'm trying to get as much separation as I can, even in the situation where I'm trying to actually use the bleed of the room. Since I've started using the stereo microphone, I've really fallen in love with it. Everything that I put it on has worked very well, including acoustic guitar and vocal. I just take the stereo mic and I turn it sideways and one capsule is looking up at the singer and the other one's looking down at the guitar. And I can simply raise it or lower it to change the balance of the two. I'm Barry Rudolph, a recording engineer. I started recording engineering in 1969. I have over 30 gold and platinum albums that I've worked on. Artists like Leonard Skinner, Hall of Oates, two albums with Rod Stewart, 
Pat Benatar record I mixed, and then also Johnny Mathis and those kind of singers too. So I teach uh, my own class, Project Studio Design here at uh, Musicians Institute. I think it was a great learning experience for the students. They heard the band live in the room, the drums are loud. They came after the recording back into the control room and listened to the recording and we solo and show them which one of those mics sound like on its own and all together as a group. So from the standpoint of the learning, they could hear exactly the real sound of what the mics without any kind of edit trickery, no compression, no EQ, just straight in. So there's the kick. Um, yeah, just a little high pass on that kick. And there's the snare. That's the hat. So the overheads are like this. So you got, you know, and then the bass. So it's a bass mic, not, it's not a direct, it's the mic. And that's a condenser mic on the guitar. Now you can hear the, the bleed we've got on the, mic, on the piano mic. That's a hard one. That would be the one that would be kind of tough. All those instruments are close together. There's no separation that you would get or try to get normally in the studio. So the live recording, so it's a balance of all the instruments plus all the leakage factors into the sound. So you sometimes you have to figure out what's what's going to work uh, in that situation. The one thing with um, with ribbon microphones is they're all figure eight. Okay, so the microphone is open live in the back. And normally what I would have done is I would have put one of those microphone shields. The reason I didn't put one up is because I don't want to cover her up. The Beatles use a U48, which is like a U47, except it has, instead of like a 47 is cardioid and omni, the U48 has cardioid and fig eight. It's the different difference between, two. so they would sing looking at each other in one mic. My biggest advice to anybody as a recording engineer, always be in record. It's like, hey, you know, let's, let's just try one. Let's just run it down. Well, I'm in record, okay? And I'm capturing everything, 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 right? Like I said, a lot of magic happens on take one. Is it, is it absolutely perfect every note? Nope. But if it's got great feel, to me, that's perfection, is when it feels great. You listen to it, you believe it. The hair on your arms starts to stand up. It's like, yeah, we got some magic happening here. You know, those are the, those are the, the, the moments that we live for in the studio, are those magic moments. Yeah.